Um, my talk is going to be over. Uh, there's no place like a dual homed. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending and watching. So first off, who is David E. Young Jr.? Well, I've worked in the IT industry for approximately 23 years, last 10, 11 years in the security industry. I have now worked in healthcare, government, financial, and utility industries. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a very amateur lock picker, avid gamer, PC master race. I like nerdcore rap and dubstep, and I'm into anime and Gundam models. So first off, uh, before we get into this talk, we of course have to give the uh, disclaimer. Uh, I'm going to read this. I do apologize for reading it directly. The views, opinions, and research expressed in this presentation are those of the researcher and do not represent any current or past employers. All questions and concerns regarding this research should be forwarded to the researcher for comment and consideration. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to discuss a little bit about what the standard definition of a dual home system is, why people would use a dual home system, um, talk a little bit more on, but wait, there's more going deeper that I discovered in mine, uh, a little bit of a demo video that I have, and then discuss how to prevent this from happening on your network. Um, now the questions, because of the way uh, B-Sides Columbus is doing the presentation format, questions will, of course, be uh, available in the uh, chat afterwards, and I will ma make sure to make myself available to answer any questions at that time. So let's go over a dual home system. So the standard definition of a dual home system is more than one network interface. Now, generally, this was put in equipment for redundancy. You'd see server class, a lot of network type equipment would have dual interfaces so that if something happened to the one interface, you could easily be back up and running quickly on the second interface. Uh, now, what's interesting with Windows and the Windows OS, when you put two network interfaces in, you can then set them up on different subnets. So you essentially, you can create uh, a, a kind of a homemade OS based router or, or hidden network behind that second interface. And this is a little graphic that kind of exemplifies this. Now, what was kind of funny was way back in the I386 days, and yes, I'm dating myself a little bit there, um, I had cable modem, and then I had an old system that had two network interfaces, and it really didn't have the router, but it was a dual home system where I used internet connection sharing back in the Windows 95, 98 days, and I bridged those across so that I could have multiple systems behind a, a small hub connected into that one so that they all got internet and had internet access. Well, why would you use a dual home system? You know, it's, but why? And I wondered this too. So before we de dive into this a little bit more, um, I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of a story. So we're on an assessment. Um, now this assessment is, we already kind of know the network. Uh, we work for the company. Uh, we're provided with all the information. We know kind of the ins and outs of the network at that time. We were told at one point that they do have a lab environment. And they were told us that even if you find it, you'll never get into that lab environment. Well, that was kind of mistake number one. Never challenge someone going on an assessment because they will do everything they can to figure out how to get in there. So based on this information, and we kind of knew where it was, we kind of went looking for it. So let's kind of go over why you would use a dual home system. Now. In like the previous slide, it, its original concept and thought pattern was to be used um, for network redundancy. That was the original thought. On a Windows system though, you can set the second interface to a different subnet. So this helps create a whole different network within a network per se, if you, if you want to do that. 
Now, sometimes uh, if you're using a legitimate use, that other subnet could be uh, a backup network or something like that where you're pulling backups onto that or even remote management. ILOs are, are known for that. That's more at the hardware level, though, not at the OS level, of course. So with this set work, second network interface, you can then have a, a lab, a dev, a test environment without the additional cost of network hardware. You don't have to buy you know, a switch and get it plugged in and go through all the processes within the company of first figuring out you know, how are you going to purchase it, where does the money come from, then of course the process of getting it approved, then once it's purchased, uh, of course, then you've got to work with your, your IT or networking staff to get it installed, to get it configured, that type of thing. And generally, no offense to those departments, they're all busy. Everybody's, you know, extremely busy doing everything they can to do what they can. And sometimes these things fall on the wayside because they're not a priority in order to maintain the network and keep the company running. And I'm, I'm not faulting any companies. I've worked uh, in IT and all aspects of IT, and I know what it's like to be there. But sometimes these processes is what create these problems in the first place. So how do you discover a dual home system? Well, first off, during your normal recon, say you are able to get onto a system, uh, primarily as this is showing. It's a window system, and we were using Cobalt Strike, so as you can see, this is a beacon, and I run the IP config on this. Now, what's interesting is I see, okay, well, there's a 192.168.20.10, that's, we'll say, is the uh, expected network, but then we see a second network interface on there, and I'm like, well, what is this 10.10.50 network? What What is there? And, okay, so we have two different IP addresses, and 101050, according to all our documentation, wasn't supposed to be any aspect of that network or anywhere on that network. So then, you know, and the thinking is, okay, well, they have a, a hidden network. Uh, and I'm going to air quote that in a sense that they had a network that nobody else knew about that they had created kind of on their own by just throwing in a, a 7 to $10 network card uh, into uh, the system. So now you see you've compromised the dual home system. What is the new network? You see a second adapter. Is there anything behind it? Um, now there are various methods uh, to use the initial device as a pivot. Uh, the most common one is to set up a proxy through it uh, or there or uh, other tools where you can install some of the tools on the compromised system and scan behind it. Now, installing tools can uh, unfortunately trigger, you know, their AV, their IDS, IPS, can trigger all kind of alerts and let them know that you're there. If you're trying to be a bit stealthy, you kind of want to avoid that. You might want to make sure you, you uh, live off the land, as they say, and use some of the built-in tools within Windows if you can, in order to keep from being detected. Now, obviously, if you're already compromised the system, Theoretically, you should be detected, but a lot of times you're not. And then there's this thing called SMB name pipe, which you can use. Um, now, you can use the initial target as a pivot to perform a quick ping sweep. Um, another good one is uh, ARP-A. This kind of shows you the ARP tables and kind of reveals to you all the other systems uh, that this target that you're on has already talked with. So here's a quick screenshot. Uh, once we're on that system, we do uh, run the shell, run an ARP-A. I can see the interface 192.168.20.10. It's talked to different addresses on the 192.168 area. OK. Then I see um, looking at the 1010.5 interface, and I, I, I'm like, well, wait a minute. It's talked to a 1010.5. 50.10. So it has talked to other devices on that other side of that interface. Well, that proved to be very interesting. So how can you get the systems behind the dual home one that you've initially compromised? Um, how can you get to those other systems behind there? Now, like I said, you can use a proxy pivot. Um, 
Now, in my experience of using a proxy pivot, whilst effective, they, the technique can be very slow. And I seem to have, or I personally have had issues with not, you can't get all the tools you might want to use to work through that proxy pivot. So there have been some issues with that. Now, after a little bit of research and uh, working with one of my coworkers, we found that Cobalt Strike can do something called an SMB named pipe. And we said, well, can we use this? Can we use this SMB named pipe in order to tunnel through from one interface to the other into that further network? So uh, this is the route we decided to go with. Um, so what is an SMB named pipe? So named pipes are like open TCP ports where the client can connect to a server listening to a given port. Uh, a process is registered, and then the name pipe and connections to that SMB to the endpoint are sent to this process. So another good reason to use SMB name pipe is on networks, if you're dealing in a network that's monitored, uh, they have a blue team that's watching traffic, uh, sometimes if they see HTTP or HTTPS traffic going from one device to another device, that might raise some alarms. But SMB in a Windows environment, or if there are Windows in that environment, that traffic is everywhere. It's hard to really filter down. Now, a good, finely tuned uh, blue team will know that if SMB is talking from one endpoint device to another endpoint device, this isn't right, because generally that SMB is normally talking from endpoint device to servers. Um, and also, to a lot of the times when you use the SMB, that's not blocked because of it being a Windows environment. But a lot of the other channels that you might use, whether it be TCP or HTTP or HTTPS, might be blocked if you are dealing with any firewalls in between there. Now, fortunately, with this situation, there are no firewalls other than possibly what's enabled on the endpoint device that we've compromised itself. But uh, we were fortunate and we did not run into any of that. So, but wait, there's more. Um, so as we compromised the initial host and then were able to use SMB name pipe and to get into another host inside of that 101050 network, looking around on different machines in there or find, you know, finding different machines and running some ARPs and we did do some initial ping scans to try to figure out what's on those networks. I was able to discover that there was another on the 101050, another dual home system there. And it had a, we'll say a 17216 address range. So it was even a different subnet. So essentially they had gone three deep in creating the, this uh, in secret environment that they had running. Um, so then the question became, well, can Cobalt strike with the SMB name pipe, drill even further in there, and that says PIP, I do apologize, pipe, connect into those areas, essentially go three deep. So we go from the compromised host into another host within there with SMB name pipe on that second interface on the initial compromised host, and then from that host that's dual homed, can we use SMB name pipe to tunnel through into that third network that we're finding? And what was really interesting is that, yes, we were able to do this. Now, here's an interesting, uh, lovely diagram. So user A on PC box A, now this is in a lab environment that I set up so that we can protect the innocent of where this really happened, um, is the initial compromised host. Uh, we were able to get on that host, we'll say, uh, because it was missing a patch. Um, and then we escalated up uh, the star or the red, you know, the star there represents that I have system level privileges on it. And then via SMB named pipe, I was able to tunnel through it into box B. And as you can see, it came through a system because they were doing password reuse throughout this, these two other environments. So that made it easier that everything that I dumped off of the user A box and from previous areas within this assessment, I was able to reuse hashes and tie through through SMB name pipe into box B 
and then also into box C. So, <laughs> so going even further down the yellow brick SMB name pipe road, so I was even to go even deeper, as I said, into this third makeshift network. I was able to gain full control of all systems at each level. And then I was also able to exfiltrate, exfiltrate uh, sensitive data and more password hashes as I went in because they did have a few passwords that were local only to those small work group networks that they had created. Um, one of the main things too that popped up uh, three levels deep was they had went out and bought a off-the-shelf uh, NAS uh, system which uh, you know something they were using for drive storage and they were storing files there and Unfortunately with that, they had left all the default credentials on that. So I was able to log into those uh, those uh, mini NAS, those hard drive storage systems, pull all the data off of them, and then show that I was able to compromise all the way into those systems. So we're gonna get a little brave now. Now, um, I am not going to try this live. Uh, I'm going to use a demo video that I had created previously because I'm not quite brave enough to do that. Let me just switch over here. So as you can see, I'm showing that I've already compromised box A. Um, and I've escalated the, the, the star as it designates here in Cobalt Strike. And at this time, I um, I don't show in this video, but I've already done the ARP A, and I've already figured out that there's another box back behind there on 10.10.50.10 via the ARP A command through a shell. So I go in, I add it in as a target. Uh, I don't put any information because I'm not sure, you know, what type of OS this target is. I know it's a Windows, uh, you know, is it Windows 10, Windows 7, a server class? or anything, I just put in the IP so that I can target it via Cobalt Strike. And then I use PSExec to log in, and I use a box A to box B uh, listener that I created, which is the SMB named pipe listener that I've created, and I called it box A to box B, and reusing the administrator, uh, local administrator credentials, which unfortunately, was shared throughout this environment and launched the attack, waited for it to come back. And then as you can see, based on this and with this little chain linkages here, I am now tied into that system. And Cobalt Strike does an interesting thing. It sees the other interface already, the 172.16.50, and kind of gives me a hint that this system is dual homed also. So once I get on that system, I need to interact with it. And as I'm pointing out here, um, change the sleep time so that I can uh, interact a little bit quicker with it, which I just change it to sleep zero. And as we're waiting for that to cycle back around, skip ahead a little bit here still see it's talking back through the initial host that I've uh, that I compromised so then I decided to say okay let's dump some hashes and let's run Mimi cats on us and pull anything we can and there are clear texts on this and that I also looking at the credentials tab I noticed that the hashes are the same for the administrator from both sides and this is all that I pulled off of box B. Now, based off of that and seeing, okay, now I'm going to do this IP config on the box and I'm like, oh, well, wait a minute. This system has two network interfaces. So can I go even deeper? So I'm going to do an ARP A and I can say, oh, well, it's, it's 50.5, but it's been talking to 50.10. Well, can I target that 50.10 and create another connection and essentially go three deep? Now, 
Uh, unfortunately, I've kind of spoiled this and shown that, that yes, you can. So I add the target. Um, I put it as an unknown, as I said, because I'm not sure what the system is. So I've got the target set up. And I'm going to say, OK, let's use the box B administrator password, but let's take out the domain because it's actually a work group. And I forgot, oh, I need to create the named pipe listener. So let's add it. So this is going to be, as I call it, box B to box C. It's going to be an SMB named pipe. One more, there we go. But the host is going to be the second interface in box B, which is the 172.16.50.10. And unfortunately, when you click away, uh, your pop-up drops away and you have to start all over from the beginning again. So I enter in the information. In the drop-down, I select SMB named pipe. I set it to 172.16.50.5 which is where I want from that box C to talk into in box B, and hopefully that talks back. back. All right, I select a port for it. And then now I'm going to say, okay, well, let's PS exec into that box using box B administrator credentials, which if you look, the hashes are the same. And I'm going to choose the session that's on box B already. I'm going to launch that. And we got to wait for it. Now it gets a little bit, it does get a little laggy. But as you can see now, let's pause that. I now have access, system level access on 172.16.50.5, 50.10. Sorry. Through 172.16.50.5. So essentially now, and as you can see with the little chain links there that Cobalt Strike shows, I have access three networks deep, all because they use dual network systems here. So we're going to hit play. And of course, uh, that time I'm going to interact with that system. Then I'm going to. Uh, Change it to sleep zero so they interact as fast. Dump some more hashes. Also run Mimi Cats on it. I also did some more exploring, but for this example for the talk, I just kind of show uh, getting getting the target and also uh, getting the credentials off of it at the time. And as I show there that I have now landed on 172.16.50.10. Uh, now, Cobalt Strike has this interesting visualization, which I'll show again, the pivot graph. And this is what I showed before in my slide deck. And I kind of move it around here to give you a better view. So essentially, I am daisy chained from box A through SMB name pipe into box B through two interfaces there through an SMB name pipe into box C. So that's essentially how we were able to get three deep into this network and find this hidden lab dev network that they had set up and told us that we would never find and we'd never be able to get into. Well, at this point in time, uh, of course, like I said, I found the little off the shelf home uh, NAS that they had put in there. Uh, I had exfiltrated all, of course, all the passwords from this local networks that they were, the work groups that they were using. I also exfiltrated all the config files. This was mainly for config files and different system files for setting up uh, some very secure network areas. And we were able to use, show that information that we were able to gather those. And what we could have done, you know, as a malicious actor is we could have re-reviewed those config files, altered them some way to get some type of persistence, put them back in place, and they would have never known that we were there. So what if we don't have Cobalt Strike? And this is kind of the issue I'm running into now because uh, I'm at a new company and I don't have access to Cobalt Strike. 
there has been an SMB named pipe added to Metasploit, but I try, I've tried several times and I still continue to work on it. I was only able to go, we'll say, from box A to box B. I can't seem to get it to go from box B to box C and talk all the way back to box A, which talks to me. Um, I, I just I haven't been able to work on it. Uh, I'm hoping somebody else would be willing to help me out with this, or um, if they see this talk, uh, they have got it working in, in this type of method, and they can let me know. Uh, because I would love to be able to provide a way that uh, users can see this and work on this and and use this without uh, if they don't have the option of a Cobalt Strike license. Uh, even though uh, I hope one day to go back to using Cobalt Strike and Cobalt Strike is a wonderful tool, but I, you know there has to be either either via Metasploit or if they know some other C2. Uh, software out there that uses SMB namepipe that possibly can do this that's open source and free and that we can possibly use. Uh, here I link uh, the reference material, uh, the blog from Cobalt Strike on uh, SMB uh, help on SMB beacon and also on named pipe pivoting. Um, and then also uh, the article that I used for that says it's SMB namepipe pivoting on interpreter. Um, I think Meterpreter works if it's if you're named pipe pivoting and you're all in the same network. You're not hopping through from one interface to another interface. Um, I imagine it works really good if you're hopping from machine to machine via SMB name pipe, which I can see advantages to that in a network if you're also wanting to be a little stealthy. You're wanting to hide um, your traffic. You don't want uh, you to be noticed if you're using SMB traffic. Again, like I've said previously, uh, this would prevent you from being spotted as easily versus doing, um, you know, HTTP or HTTPS traffic from PC to PC. So, yeah, if you could go ahead and fix your broken stuff, that would be great. So some of the mitigations. So the biggest one that came out of this after we did our out briefing on this was really look at your policies and procedures. Um, it, it 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 was kind of interesting that the biggest problem that they they needed a lab dev environment, but they ran into issues with uh, budgeting and knowing how to get the equipment ordered, get it installed, get it set up properly. Uh, that was the biggest thing that we heard was, yeah, we get that, we understand that we shouldn't have done that, but the problem is we needed this dev environment we needed it we thought this was the most secure way that we could set it up on our own and that's what happens users need something done they are going to find a way to do it um, another big thing is of course if you do set up properly use uh, proper network segmentation with firewalls consider two-factor authentication especially if there it's highly sensitive data behind in those areas um, and uh, you know, I'm a fan of if, if it's really, really high sensitive, it should have a true air gap. Um, yeah, you have to come up with a procedure or policy or way to move the data from inside that air gap network to on your regular network. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, which way do you want to work with that? Um, also, user education. Um, you know, I don't want to beat up on the user. That's why it's kind of in the bottom of my list here because um, account. I apologize for that. Uh, my microphone died, so I had to switch batteries. Um, user education, I was saying, password reuse. Uh, also, let them know that setting up homebrewed networks, bringing in equipment that's not authorized or not approved, uh, does not provide adequate security, does open things up and cause more problems than they might know. Um, also, consistent hardware inventory of your environment. Um, catching when you notice that for some odd reason now, uh, John's PC now has two network cards. Why does it have two network cards? That's not what we issue out standard. How did that happen? Um, I, so, you know, keeping a good inventory of your systems and keeping track of that is really important. 
so uh, questions um, I'm gonna leave this only up here for a second I will be in the chat uh, available uh, to answer any questions anybody has once they watch this talk um, I will put up my information that is my Twitter account if you wish to contact me that way or my email um, and you know I'm not afraid of any spam uh, because Gmail does have some decent filters so I'm not too worried about that so I do want to thank B-Sides uh, I really want to thank B-Sides I did have emergency pop up and I did have to record this video a little bit later than the deadline and I appreciate them giving me the opportunity to go ahead and record it uh, at this time when I've got it done and get it to them and I do appreciate them accepting me uh, to talk uh, at B-Sides. I really do enjoy B-Sides and I do hope to be able to shake hands and see people next year face to face uh, but um, you know it is what it is with the whole uh, world and how everything's going on right now so hopefully that's all cleared up by next year and we can all see each other face to face then. Again I want to thank everybody for watching my talk and attending. Uh, I want to thank B-Sides Columbus and um, Everybody, I hope you have a good day. Thank you.